Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillah. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad al-Fatih ni ma'ughlika wa khatimi ni ma'asabaka na'asa al-haq wa al-haq wa al-hadi ila siratika mustaqim wa ala alihi haqa qadrihi wa kadarihi al-azim. Shaykh Ibrahim continues his his treaties, his didactic poem on the nature of etiquette, the actual Actually, the spirit, the the spirit, the soul, the life of good manners, good goodly manners. Um, it's interesting because I think in this line that we're going to, and in, in, in these lines today, we will actually come across by way of some of the commentators on the Rahman Adab. Probably one of the main reasons why Shaykh Ibrahim um, took to writing this poem. Um, uh, uh, it's about the nature of adab, uh, and as a brief um, snapshot in intro, um, adab is not, or as a, as a for, uh, as a way of foreshadowing. That's that's what we're looking for. As a way of foreshadowing. That main point, um, adab is not so much an issue of you better act right, or you're gonna get, or something's gonna happen to you. It's not so much that as it is tofiq. Um, tofiq is that your will and Allah's will would coincide, meaning that you would get what you, that what you want to be what Allah wants. That's called tofiq. Um, a cohesion, tofiq is a kind of cohesion, um, because you can want all types of things, whereas Allah will only have what He wants. And so, if your will coincides with Allah's will, you are muwaffaq. You have, you have been given tofiq. But a lot of people think that means, oh, it means that you've been given. You know the go ahead or the ability to do something, but <coughs> it's not really so much that because people have been given the ability to do, do to do many things which are to their own destruction. But tawfiq is to one's advantage because Allah only wants good for His slaves. Whereas if He was to give us what we want um, unconditionally, then that would be to our detriment because we have no no insight or understanding. So it's actually to our it's a, uh, an act of Allah's mercy that He doesn't give us everything that we want, or even the things that we want the most. Um, but if Allah puts it in the heart of someone to want Him, that person has tawfiq. Because what else do you think it is that Allah really wants, other than Himself? Like what would what would He want? You can say, well, He wants His Prophet peace be upon Him. Yeah, but His Prophet peace be upon Him is made for Himself. So what does he really want? And then he can say, oh, well, that's arrogant, because, no, Allah knows his value, and since he knows his value, he wants himself. And he also knows that there's nothing but him to want in the first place. So then the question can be, well, then why create all these creations and do all these things? Uh, well, part of it is because beauty can't, cannot be contained, and beauty spills over. The nature of beauty is that it cannot be contained, and Allah is is uh, beautiful, and He loves that which is beautiful, as the Hadith says. Allah is beauty, and He loves that, and He loves beauty. So He loves Himself, and perhaps that scattered beauty that is located all over the place is nothing but an indication, a reflection of Himself. And you can say, "Well, that's that's uh, narcissism. God's a narcissist." No. If you were that beauty, if if you were that beautiful, wouldn't you be the same way? <laughs> anyway, uh, he says the Tamir of Shaksin Ramadan is so muhu, waka imun fihi, yumaha jor muhu. Hajun muratun was sir lo sadaka, min hilly mal and nematel ka sadaka. So we're just going to do these two lines today. Um, and 
commentaries that we're looking at, well, some of them will be quoted directly, some of them inspired from. But he said, uh, um, one of the commentators, uh, he said about this uh, particular line, this is um, um, Musa Suleiman Tijani. He said, uh, Akbaru Amal, no, sorry, the meaning of this is, sorry, the meaning of these two lines is, uh, literally, it means the renovation or the reconstruction of a person, the fasting of Ramadan, and standing in it erases one's um, bad actions, basically, harmful actions. <coughs> um, the uh, pilgrimage and the lesser pilgrimage, Umrah, and um, sadaqah given in secret from goodly from goodly from halal means what a a blessed charity is that what, and so what are, what are all these things they're referring again to that which um, is a means for wiping away sin um, when it comes to the sin of the people who don't know Allah their sin is going against sharia the sin of the people who know Allah is the sin of going against sharia as well as the sin of um, the appearance of the of the um, their selves with a with a capital or with a lowercase self. Yeah. So the the knower of Allah is actually can be guilty of of more sins than the person who doesn't, and the goodly deeds of a person who knows Allah is actually the sin of the araf. So a person who knows Allah and obeys Him, uh, the person who doesn't know Allah and obeys Him, that that person's good deed is the sin of the Arif. Because the person who knows Allah, uh, again I'm sorry, the person who doesn't know Allah and obeys Him still is guilty of the shirk of their own existence. And that is the, that is the, That is the, the the bad deed. That's the bad deed of the one who knows who knows him. <laughs> so, the the best deed of the one who doesn't know Allah is the bad deed of the one who knows him. Because the good deed of the one who knows Allah is still stained with the shirk of their own existence, whereas the one who knows Allah. And maybe they're really awful in terms of sharia. They're still in a better place in that sense because they're not guilty of shirk. But that doesn't that doesn't absolve them of of outward sin. It doesn't. But it does indicate the the fadl of Allah, the grace of Allah. Allah graces some people with doing good deeds. He graces other people with a certain kind of knowledge. Any the person who's the most graced is a person who um, does the best of deeds and has that knowledge. So obviously, what 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 one would want to do is to aim to be the best. Obviously, and that's the expectation actually. And it's not a good deed to be um, a law slave. It's what you were created for. So if you if you if you were to do that, you would be useful. Um, If that were to be your your way of interacting with Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, you would be useful. If you knew Him and you obeyed Him, you're useful now. <laughs> you're serving your purpose. Because if you do good deeds, your heart is your heart is clean. And if you don't, if you're not a polytheist, even to the extent of your own existence, then your perception is clean. If your heart and your perception are clean, then you are you are a useful mirror. For Allah to see Himself in. Whereas if you have the smudge of bad deeds on on you, or you have the smudge of a false perception on you, or both, then what kind of a mirror are you that you're covered in grime? So that when Allah looks at looks at you, He doesn't see Him. You know, He's He wouldn't technically see Himself. Obviously, Allah sees Himself everywhere. 
in, in as much as there is no everywhere. There's only him. <laughs> and that's an entirely different conversation. But from a theoretical point of view, if Allah were to look at a mirror and find it full of the grime and, uh, and, and filth of other than him, whether it, be in, whether it be in terms of obedience or in terms of perception, then what, how useful is that mirror? And I'm using the word if here. Uh, so to continue with this, as we've said many times, Ruh al-Adab is a poem for the, for, for the knowers of Allah to tighten up their relationship with Him. And these lines are talking about the removal of sin, and they're talking specifically about the, those sins which ruin one's um, perception as well as... Um, uh, I put it in a nice way before. It, it, it ruins, uh, mashallah, it, it ruins one's perception uh, themselves and also ruins one's reflective capacity um, as, a, as, as a mirror. So he said uh, another, uh, another way to alleviate that kind of grime, he said, ta'miru shakhsin. It means literally um, to reconstruct or, or to construct a person. But the, our commentator, um, uh, Suleyman Atidani, he said, Ta'amir al-Shakhsin. Uh, Ta'amir al-Shakhsin, Ramadan al-Sawmuhu, Qa'imun fihi, Yamahad al-Muhu. We're going to take it bit by bit. Um, Akbaru amalan in the Allah, Ladi yunalu bihi, Ridahu, who were infaqu fi sabilillah. He said that the greatest action by which a person attains the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is standing in the way of Allah. So, uh, here he's taking one bit, t- taking a piece at a time, spending in the way of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, um, and another way of understanding uh, how how is helping a, a person or how is reconstructing or constructing a person. What's it mean? So, for example, building the house of someone, um, so that he can live in that house for the duration of their life, that is a you know that is the kind of good goodness done to someone else that Sheikh is talking about doing that. Making it, uh, providing habitation for someone else um, is the kind of thing that which, which uh, wipes away one's sins. And, that, and, and that's a very big thing. So imagine, you know, being a source of housing for people or a source of shelter for them or a source of food for them or a source of, you know, providing people their basic means of existence. You know, even if it's only for a short time, it's there to wipe away the grime of your own existence. And Ta'amir al-Shaksin, or spending, spending, uh, another way of, another way of putting this is, another way of looking at the, the lines here, could all, the lines could also mean that a person themselves, so spending on some, spending on someone, or a person spending themselves in the way of Allah, so it can be looked at both ways. Another way of looking at this is spending one's life in the obedience of Allah. Um, whereas if, if someone doesn't do that, then their life will be their life will be a life of grief and and um, and regret. Uh, there's a hadith that says, um, "The best of you who has a, the best of you is he who has a long life, and spends it in, in good actions and good in goodly deeds, and the worst of you is the one who has a long life, and they spend it." Um, and their actions are bad. They they have evil actions. That's the worst of you. Mm. Sheikh Na, Sheikh Nasr Yusuf he said that that baraka, you know, and what is baraka? Baraka is that something something little goes very very far. For example, that's a kind of baraka. He said that baraka in one's life is not by. Is not, it doesn't mean you know extensive days, and it doesn't mean living a long time. Um, but rather, baraka in one's life um, is Allah putting tawfiq into someone's life, and as a result of that, Allah putting that tawfiq. As we mentioned in the beginning, what is tawfiq? Tawfiq is that your will coincides with Allah's will. 
and Allah's will is not other than Himself. Allah is the good. So Allah's will is nothing but the good. So if a person wills good for himself and wills good for creation, that is, that is, that is due to his willing good between himself and Allah. So in other words, it's not just that you want Allah and you don't care about creation because the Prophet peace upon him didn't do that. He did care about creation only as much as he could do good for them or by them. But for example, when planting the date palms, as the hadith mentioned, the Prophet peace upon him advised some people about how to plant some date palms and it didn't come out very well. It's because in, in, in the Prophet said peace upon him, you know your you know you know your worldly affairs. You know you know them. So you can say, well, how come the Prophet peace upon him didn't know didn't know about how to plant date palms? Necessarily, no. That's because the the Prophet peace be upon him is sent for a very specific kind of good. It's a good that that transcends this world and, and the next world. If he wanted to know about date palming and how to plant them properly, he definitely could have gotten that knowledge. But he was concerned about the bigger picture, and the bigger picture is the tawfiq of the slave. And the tawfiq of the slave is that their will and Allah's will coincides. So in a way, when the people were asking him about the date palm planting and he didn't, peace upon him, give them correct agricultural advice, that was Allah's will too. <laughs> that was also Allah's will. Allah didn't will for them. Allah didn't will it. When I, when, uh, but Allah always wills the, the, the overall goodly. permanence of the slave so I'm sorry for the for this diversion but so in the, uh, the Baraka is in one's life is is tawfiq Allah is giving a person tawfiq which means that whatever a person does he finds Allah's help there Allah's assistance is there and obviously Allah is not going to assist something which leads to evil which means that if you have tawfiq it means that Allah will not allow you to engage in evil things because I'll, I'll, you know the, the, that which leads to guidance is itself guided. So if you have tawfiq, even if it looks like you're in a bad situation, if you have tawfiq, all you have to do is be patient and be have a good opinion, and you will see in the end how Allah was with you. But you may not see it while you're enduring it. So if you are given the glad tidings of tawfiq from Allah, then believe in that and don't consider the circumstances that arise because those circumstances can never go against the will of Allah. And again, the will of Allah is that what you want and what He wants coincides. So He said, Barakah in one's life is not that you live for many days, but it's rather that Allah gives you tawfiq and that tawfiq accompanies you. And the winds of hidayah come to you. And these winds of hidayah are such that the person who receives them seems to have no end in good. Uh, and the Prophet is probably one of the best examples, if not the best example of tawfiq. No matter how hard people tried to get rid of him, they couldn't stop him. No matter how hard they tried to get rid of Islam after him, it, it just makes it grow. And no matter how much people who are even within Islam try to disfigure it through their own whims, the truth always comes out and it always gets stronger and in ways that people, what people would never have imagined. Can you imagine? So, example would be the British Empire took over the entire world. The sun never set on the British Empire. But it wasn't so impressive in terms of wealth and uh, dominion as it was in, in its systematic uh, 
take over, you know, free world, you know, free market trading, capitalism basically. And it's parliamentary government, for example. These are things which the British brought to every corner of, of the world, along with its own language to this day, that capitalism, um, a parliamentary-esque government, and the English language are the mark of, of the modern world. Good or bad, it's not, uh, it's not a judgment, it just is what it is. In the British Empire, there's never been an empire greater than the British Empire in all of, the, all of world history, ever. It was actually too big for its own roots. It, it just it dissolved because it actually got too big. The only the only thing the only thing that destroyed the British Empire was itself because it just got too big. But in all of its uh, grandi grandiosity, it didn't stop. You know, people in a village, sitting around Sheikh Ibrahim, learning about the nature of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It didn't stop that. This new system, the English language, all the marks of modern society, which, you know, frankly, it doesn't really have a lot of space for religion and knowing God. It doesn't. It's not made for that. Didn't hinder Sheikh Ibrahim from his mission whatsoever. To the extent that Sheikh Ibrahim even died in front of Parliament, in front of, you know, what we call in America Big Ben, which basically is time. The the British the British system was is so is still America is just an offshoot of the British system. It's so it's so overwhelmingly massive that I'm speaking to you right now in the English language. Like why? Why would I speak? What, why would I be speaking to you in English? For what reason? I'm not an Englishman. I'm not born in America. Uh, I'm not born in England. Our cultures are basically identical. Our economics are basically identical. Our governments are basically identical. But Sheikh Ibrahim, who outwardly is just some black guy, let's face it, it's a racist system. He's a, he, he's a black guy. Like, what, what, are, black, what are black people going to offer anything? You, you don't even have the... You're not even cosmetically appealing, according to this racist system which is completely false, by the way, but let's just go along with it. <laughs> you know, the fact that so many people of light skin imitate black people and, and try to look as black as possible <laughs> kind of gives it away. But anyway, let's just move past that point. But <clears throat> outwardly speaking, Shay Ibrahim, the author of this poem, what does he do? He, the place where the wali is born, is as blessed as the place that he died. What does Shaykh Ibrahim do in an act of ultimate mercy? He goes to the center of where this system, a system which has no regard for Islam whatsoever, nor religion whatsoever, and let's be honest, there's nothing wrong in saying that. I don't think anyone in parliament would disagree that it has nothing to do with religion. Nor is it concerned about other worldly affairs. That's not, that's not what it's there for. But in reverse, a system like Islam, which, which has much to say about these kinds of what we would call short-sightedness, short short-sightedness, is, 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 <clears throat> would have much to say in retaliation against the British Empire and that kind of system. But look, Shay Ibrahim, he goes to London, he dies in St. Thomas' Hospital, which is a, literally a cross you know where Parliament is now is where the, the first royal palace built in the 11th century was built in England. That's where Parliament is now. It's the place of the, it's where the kingdom of, of, of England, which became the British Empire via the, Dutch, uh, via the East India Company, it's where it all started. So Shah Ibrahim and, and, and what we would deem as an ultimate act of mercy goes and dies directly parallel from the 
site of the palace of the Kingdom of England and where Parliament is today and where time is kept because time is kept by Greenwich it's kept according to the clocks in the UK world time the way that we understand time how we gauge time globally is determined by the UK by the clocks in Westminster or wherever Greenwich is I'm not great at the geography there just yet but I'm saying all of this to say that look at the look at the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala look at the tawfiq that Allah ta'ala has given Shaykh Ibrahim who is he himself is just a drop of the barakah of Rasulullah and I mean that in the, the utmost respect because that drop was a flood I don't mean that to, in, in, a, in a diminutive kind of way but I'm just trying to help you to think about the extent of the mercy and the guidance and the tawfiq that was with Rasulullah that will never go away that we ourselves are swimming in right now while the rest of the world frankly just doesn't seem to have any concerns whatsoever about you know <laughs> and I'm not saying we're the chosen group I'm not saying that but I am saying look at the concerns of the Muslims in general look at the concerns of our mosques look at the concerns of the average Muslim it has nothing to do with God himself whereas the Sahib al Faida, the one who brought the, the flood of Tawfiq uh, Shaykh Ibrahim Look at the tawfiq that Allah gave him because it's because of the friends of Allah that Allah's punishment doesn't fall on this earth. And look at Shaykh Ibrahim, he, the place where he lives is as blessed as the place that he dies. And, and, him, and him dying in London, it's like he made London part of synagogue <laughs> in, that, in that shared barak, barakah. And inshallah, in the future, we'll see what that means. Anyway, so in continuing about the, about the, the sort of baraka in, in, uh, in a person spending their time in the sake of Allah, which is one of the ways in which sins is wiped away, um, there's, no, there's nothing that has been sent down that is more dearer or more is dearer than tawfiq itself. And Sheikh uh, Nasr Yusuf. Uh, said something interesting about that. He said that مَا نَزَلَ مِنَ السَّمَاءِ عَزُّ مِنَ التَّوْفِيقِ مَنْ حُرِمَ الْأَدَبُ فِي الْمُعَامَلَةِ حُرِمَ التَّوْفِيقِ Whoever, there's not, it's said that there's, been, there's nothing dearer than tawfiq. And whoever has been prohibited from or blocked from um, good, good manners in his dealings has been blocked from tawfiq. And as I was saying in the beginning, I think this is the strongest lesson in this lesson, is that whoever has bad manners, whoever doesn't have adab in his dealings, doesn't have tawfiq. If you're rude to people, if you're rude to your fellow tijani, if you cut them off, block them off, you know, you're, that this, this adab, it doesn't, there's no tawfiq in that. You know, bad manner wars makes people who are engaged, none of them have tawfiq. <laughs> if you feel that someone has had bad manners towards you, so you have bad manners toward them, like how? You're just, you're assisting each other in, in, in mutual anti tawfiq. And as I said before, the ultimate tawfiq is one knowing Allah properly, because that's what Allah wants from us. And you will find that the people who are the most knowing of Allah in, in the people of the Faida, you will find them to be the people who are the most adverse to conflict. They, they seem to be almost pacifist to a point of... To, they seem um, pacifist almost to a blameworthy extent. But the truth is that they, they know that tawfiq comes from them having good manners. And they want tawfiq more than anything else. So they have goodly manners, 
better than anyone else. Uh, and one of the texts that Sheikh Al-Khairi gave to me um, to, to sort of focus on, and I'm not name dropping, I'm just I'm giving like, um, I'm trying to um, indicate some of the imports of what are inside of the, the, the books that he told me to look at. Um, in Bukhiyat al-Mustafid, uh, Bukhiyat al-Mustafid is written by uh, Ibn, uh, Ibn Arabi uh, uh, Asa'ih, which I'm, some of you have visited, some of us have visited um, his grave in, um, in Rabat. Um, may Allah have mercy on his soul. He was uh, kind of like the alam of the, of the tariqa, the, the scholar of the, the, t- the tariqa. Um, and in his text, which is might be translated as the, you know, the wish of the, of the seeker of benefits, the wish, or the aim of a seeker of benefits. I'm sure that there's a, a snazzier title than that, but that's what it means um, uh, literally. Um, he quoting uh, Sheikh Muhyiddin, uh, the Arabi the famous Andalusian Sufi, uh, he said that um, the adab, goodly manners, is the assembler of all good. In other words, it is that which brings all good together, is adab. And he said that it's divided into four different types in the terminology of the people of Allah. Uh, he said that the first type is the adab of sacred law. And it is um, divine. Um, it is divine etiquette, divine etiquette, and he, Allah Taala, has relegated its education, um, its its edification or its education is re- relegated. It's given over. It's handed over um, to two sources: to wahi, which is revelation itself, what you and I call revelation, and um, ilham. Ilham is uh, the inspiration that comes to the saints of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, and with it, uh, and also, uh, Ilham is recognized in the Quran. You see, for example, Musa, the, the, uh, the mother of Musa, alayhi salam, his mother was told to put Musa into the river Nile. Was she a Nabi? No. This is called Ilham. She was inspired by God. So is inspiration something that only comes to the NBA? No. But you don't call that inspiration that comes to the non NBA as revelation. It's not. But it's still from him. So can Allah talk to people? Yes. Does he talk to people? Yes. Does he continue to talk to people? Why would he not? <laughs> Especially when people are most in need of it. Who's to say? Well, you can tell the tree by its fruits. <clears throat> so he said that he... He edu- he um, taught his his, his uh, he he taught his messenger peace be upon him etiquette. He gave he taught him good manners peace be upon him, and it's those same and and through him and by him, um, the prophet peace be upon him is teaching us good manners, um, and uh, this is understood to be through the Sharia. He's teaching us good manners through Sharia. Um, at any rate, the the pro the the NBA, peace be upon them, they are the ones who have been taught good manners, and they are the ones who teach good manners. And it comes in the hadith, in Allah adabni fa ahsan taadibi. The hadith says that Allah taught me good manners, and what a goodly manner He taught me. And what does he mean by that? It's the be- good good manners. It's it's not good manners. Is to know how to interact with God at every moment. And the creation is the playing field of that interaction, so that when a person is interacting with creation, a person who's been taught goodly goodly interactions, and here it's at a legal level, for example, um, they are taught how to interact with creation properly. Um, as a way of adept towards them and as a way of adept towards Allah. And how do you know when someone is acting properly with creation in a legal sense? You know because the, the people come into Islam. 
So, for example, in the in in, in Indonesia, Malaysia, Singapore, Singapore, um, Philippines, Vietnam, you know, all these places in the in what's I guess would be called the Far East, in all those places, the people of Yemen, the the Habaib um, from Yemen, they came to do trading. They traded with the people in those areas. They didn't come necessarily to necessarily to bring them Islam, but they did come to do trade with them. But it's said that the their goodly manners and their and their um superior trade um ethics is what pushed people to to come into Islam. They just had good manners when it comes to when it came to law and law applies to economics. And obviously they were good, they're good people and goodly people, and they still are to this day. May Allah preserve them. Um, people came into Islam because people like goodly and attractive things. Whereas, how do you know when Islam is not being practiced properly? Because people run from you. <laughs> and they don't run from you because of propaganda. They run from you because you're a jerk. You know what I mean? Screaming on a microphone and jumping up and down and cursing people. Like, this is... Like what is this? <laughs> what is this, man? Be at least be a gentleman. Anyway, um, <coughs> the second one is qasam uh, The second, the second type is the adab of khidma, the adab of service. The second type of adab is the adab of service, and it is what the kings refer to when it comes to their servants. Um, and the king of the people of the king of the people of Allah is Allah Himself. Um, we have been given the instructions. We have been given um, the know-how of how to be servants to to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, um, and it is also it's relative to how we interact with Him, uh, how we are His servants, how we act. In other words. That when you have servants in a house, you know, the servants have a protocol. They know what to do. They know what not to do to be good servants. They know what it is. And so the law brings us that. Mm -hmm. um, and that, as I said before, that servants, servanthood is taught to us in terms of sharia because sharia gathers between the rights of the slave and the rights of the master. Or, the, or I should put it, the rights of the master and the rights of the slave. So how to be a servant is part of adab. Um, the first one was the adab of sharia, which is the sort of the do's and don'ts. But the second one is, the, is how to serve properly. How do you serve Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So there's one, is, one is obedience and the other one is service. How do you serve Allah? How do you serve His creation? Uh, and in the Sharia, we have, we have, uh, you know, for example, in the in the way that the Prophet peace upon him, in the mannerism that he applied the Sharia, is the the protocol of uh, of service. If you apply law, for example, but don't do it in the way that the Prophet did peace upon him, then you're not serving Allah properly, nor are you serving the creation properly. An example of that would be: Is it okay to beat your wife? Okay, first of all, the legal prescription of what is meant by that and what you can do by that makes a farce out of it, as a matter of fact. It's like tapping them with a, tapping them with a straw. <laughs> it, makes a, it makes you look like an idiot. It's almost as if the joke is on the one who would even try to implement it. If you look at how, what is actually legally allowed or not. You know, and we can get into conversations about why didn't Allah abolish it completely, um, and that would go back to the uh, that that itself is a completely different conversation. Um, but he, he did abolish it completely. If you look at, I mean, it, by all intents and purposes, if you look at what's legally allowed in that way, it makes a farce out of it. It makes a complete farce out of the idea of applying harm to someone else. You know? Like Allah, the law does not allow you to do that. You can't harm people. You know, even in, in terms of prisoners of war and all these kinds of things, like there are very strict codes about what you can and cannot do. But anyway, my point is, I'm getting what I'm. The point I'm getting to is that the Prophet peace be upon him 
Um, he never, you know, despite all the strenuous restrictions of, of harming one's wife, and as I, again, I'm telling you, if you read them, you'll, you, will, you will know that people are transgressing very badly and that the law has no... It makes, a farce out of it. it makes a farce out of the idea of hurting someone else, like especially someone that close to you. But even in that, the, the Prophet, peace upon him, never struck his wife, ever. He didn't st- strike his servants. He didn't strike his children. He didn't strike um, his, uh, his wives, never. So the, the, the proper, the, 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 and why? Because the, the appropriate application of the law, how the servant should act, towards other servants, for example, in this case, the, the protocol is there. And these are sensitive issues for Western people altogether. You know, just like gender relations are sensitive, um, you know, in one extreme, in one extreme of the, of the spectrum, you have people who are trying to eliminate the idea of gender altogether. And then on the other side of the extreme, you have people who they all that they want to do is make sure that the white male is on top and can do as he likes. And then somewhere in the middle, you have people that are just trying to make an argument for what seems to be the most natural course of things. <laughs> so, you know, there's a lot to be said. Uh, the third type of adab is the the adab of the truth, and that is one's etiquette with Allah and following Him in every instance of His manifestation. Um, so that every, in every action, in, in every activity, in every instance, the one who is observing this etiquette, instead of looking at that instance or looking at that um, that particular manifestation, they will look at the truth itself. So every event in the earth, this person has such good knee interactions and such good etiquette that they they use that event to turn towards Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. That's the first step. But not only are they turning towards Him, but they accept Him. They accept they accept Him in that instance, and they don't reject Him in that instance. And they're not arrogant in that instance. Um, such that even if a person comes to you and you recognize the truth in him, even though they're, old, they're younger than you, you accept it. Even though they're in a station, in a maqam that you feel is below you, you accept it. Because you... Um, because you don't refrain from accepting the truth, even from someone that appears to be younger than you or of lower rank than you. And this is being just. This is justice. Justice is that you accept the truth no matter where it comes from. That doesn't mean just conceptually. It means in in, in reality, that you realize the truth. And you realize the truth, the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is there. The, the, The little child is not there, but Allah is. And the old man is not there, but Allah is. And the, the person who is speaking to you well is not there. Allah is. And the person who's cursing you is not there, but Allah is. And this is the etiquette, the third type of etiquette, the ed- etiquette of the truth. The etiquette of the truth is that you never reject him in, in any form. Uh, and I guess that would manifest in severe passivity. <laughs> but it isn't passivity, because the person will act in, against, according to the law when he's supposed to. But internally... You know, externally, you act as if you are the one in control. Internally, you, you know that you are not. And the internal st- status of someone who has adab in this manner is that they, <coughs> they don't reject Allah at any point. They see Him first, and then they consider the effects of His presence after. So they see Allah before they see the little boy. And then they see the effect of Allah in that little boy, and that the little boy might do something that that is not that great. But that doesn't turn the person who witnesses them away from Allah. And it also doesn't turn them away from mercy towards that child. 
So, for example, when the man came into the, to the uh, masjid, and uh, in the time of the Prophet, peace be upon him, he started to urinate, the Sahaba, at that time, those of them who were there and got angry, all they could see was, was a man peeing. Whereas, Allah alam, but it seems to be that the Prophet, peace be upon him, he saw Allah in that instance. And instead of telling those people, who they knew that they, they knew that he knew that they wanted to clobber him. But Allah, but the Prophet peace upon him said, Let him let him finish. <laughs> he said, Let him finish. And then when the man finished, he went over to him and he said, he explained to him, Okay, alhamdulillah, like this is the masjid and this is what it's used for. He explained to him in a nicely in a nice fashion, and then he had the Sahaba bring over some water and clean up the area. From that we learned so many things. We learned about the the presence of the Prophet peace be upon him with his Lord. How else, how else could he have been so kind? We also learned um, the way to deal with people who don't know things about Islam. It's not to, you know, is there anything more devastating or degradating than urinating in the Mosque of Allah? You know, if people had drawn pictures of the Prophet peace be upon him in that day and time, cartoons against him, how do you think he would have responded? Would he have responded in the way that some of us have responded? Or would he, would, or would he tell them, let him finish? <laughs> you know, we, we, know, you know, we never really know. But I am more of the inclination that the Prophet, peace upon him, would have demonstrated a tremendous level of presence with God in that instance. And it would manifest in a merciful manner towards the people who might have done wrong. And I would have imagined that it would have been so beautiful that the people who who did that would have exposed themselves to themselves. And like the man who was told about urinating in the mosque, that man, he, as far as I know, he became Muslim. Imagine these people who have exposed the, the angst in their hearts and, ex, and exposed how much they actually need God to everyone. If, that, if they were to have been dealt with in this goodly manner, how their hearts would have melted. Because when Allah, you know, you know, when the truth comes, falsehood vanishes. So the person, the knower of Allah, if he's able to see Allah in an instance, any falsehood which is other than Allah that might be there in that instance vanishes. And I don't know about you, but that's a lot more appealing to me, to see Allah in every instance. And then to deal with the effects of Allah's presence in a goodly fashion, than to be blind from Him in every instance and to be angry all the time. But that takes insaf, you know, that takes a person being just and balanced. Uh, and that means that you can't, you have to be willing to accept when Allah is there. And you have to be willing to accept Allah's effects. And that's the adab that's required from us. Otherwise, what are we doing? The only one who's hurting, the only one who's being hurt by that is ourselves. When we refuse to have good, good adab with God, the only one who we hurt is ourselves. <coughs> the fourth uh, etiquette is um, literally it means to abandon to abandon etiquette and to return all of that to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, and what. Um, Ibn Sa'ih says, he says, to leave etiquette, the words of Shaykh Muhyiddin, to leave etiquette, what's meant by that is that you don't see etiquette itself. You don't see etiquette, you don't see adav. It doesn't, it, it, it's that you don't witness the etiquette. Um, it doesn't mean that you don't witness its existence which is a very, very subtle point. It means that you, you don't see this thing called, called etiquette, but you see what its actual existence is. And if you know anything, you know that Allah is. And you don't let your shuhud veil you from Allah. So that in that instance, you know who... You know what... Who, you know who the shahid is. You know who the witness is. You know what shahada is. You know what the witnessing is. 
and you know what the mashhud is, you know what the one being witness is. That's the that's the that's um, the the fourth kind of etiquette. And at the end of that, uh, Ibn Arabi, uh, sorry, at the end of that, um, uh, Ibn Sa'i, he says that, as for us, we say that adab is knowing the self. نقول الأدب معرفة النفس It's knowing oneself. من عرف نفسه عرف ربه Whoever knows himself knows his Lord. Uh, in this line, in this sort of, um, we've been dealing with this sort of um, gathering between the outward and the inward Sharia and reality and and adab and the four types and this this kind of thing. I wanted to mention something that uh, Ibn Arabi also says in the Fasul al Hikam, and we're going to stop here after having read this. Um, I realize we haven't gotten very far today. We, we we've actually only covered, oh my goodness, I think we only covered half of one of the lines, Tamir Shaksin. But this is really important stuff, so we'll continue with this next time. But uh, Ibn Arabi, he says, in the ringstone of the wisdom of exaltedness in the word of Musa, of Moses, he starts talking about when Musa salam, and Khidr salam, when they parted ways from each other. And so, the Kahf, um, he says, uh, as for the wisdom of his separation, God says of the messenger, Musa salam, hold to what the messenger brings to you, and consider forbidden that which he... I'm oh, sorry, God said to the Prophet, peace upon him, sorry. As for the wisdom of his separation, of, of Musa's separation from Khidr, God says of the Messenger, وسلم, hold to what the Messenger brings to you and consider forbidden what he has forbidden from you. Those who know God, he continues, who know the measure of messengerhood and the Messenger go no further than these words. Khidr knew that Musa was a messenger of God. And so paid close attention to whatever he said, so that he might fulfill all the demands of adab with the messenger, here Musa, a.s. He said to him, if, Khidr said to him, Khidr said to Musa, if after this I question you, sorry, Musa said this to Khidr, my apologies, Musa said this to Khidr, if after this, I question you regarding anything. Don't keep my company. Um, for forbidding him from keeping his company. When all three incidents have come to pass, so you know the incidents with Khidr alayhi salam, that you know, the, he, Khidr alayhi salam put a, boat, a hole in the boat and he, he killed the child and he, he built the wall without giving pay. So when all three, when all three incidents had come to pass, he said, Musa, uh, Khidr alayhi salam said, this is the separation between us. Moses did not say to him, do not do this. Musa, Musa, Musa didn't say to Khidr after him saying that, no, 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 don't separate. He didn't say that. Khidr, Khidr said to him, this is the separation between us. Moses did not say to him, do not do this. And did not seek his company, knowing the measure of the rank that was occupied by him, and which made him turn away his companionship. Moses was then silent, and they t- separated. Contemplate the perfection of these two men, both in knowledge and in fulfilling the demands of divine adab, and also the just discernment of Khidr in recognizing what Moses possessed and saying, I have knowledge God has taught me, and which you know not, and you have knowledge God has taught you, which I know not. That Khidr should tell Moses this was the balm for the wound inflicted by, and how would you know, and how would you bear patiently that which you have never encompassed in, in my knowledge? Though he knew the exaltedness of his degree of messengership, that degree was not possessed by Khidr. So the commentator, uh, who is, his name is. Um, Kanner Dagbi. He said that for Ibn Arabi, the parting of Moses and Khidr was a demonstration of spiritual adab and a recognition by Khidr of Musa's spiritual rank. 
As a messenger of God, Moses was Moses surpassed Hither, although Hither was a teacher to Moses when it came to inward things. Ibn Arabi reads Moses' statement, If after this I question you regarding anything, keep, keep no company with me, as a kind of command with Hither, which, which Hither would not disobey, knowing Moses' rank. At the same time, Hither softened his apparent rebuke of Moses' impatience by telling him that God had given him each of them that God had given each of them knowledge, which the other did not possess. For his part, Moses did not object to the separation and kept his word. So then, um, Ibn Arabi continues and says, "Now this appears in the Muhammadan community in the tradition of the of the pollination of the date palms." which is something I mentioned before, and I won't go over it again for sake of brevity. He said to his companions, upon him be peace. You know better what is beneficial in this, your lower world. There is no doubt that knowledge of a thing is better than ignorance of it. That is why God praises, praises himself as being he who has knowledge of all things. The prophet recognized, peace be upon him, that his companions knew better than he what was beneficial in their lower world, for in this case he had no expertise. It was knowledge acquired through experience and through practice, and the Prophet peace be upon him did not occupy himself in acquiring it. Nay, he was busy with the most important of all things. I have called your attention to a great adab, which will benefit you if you apply it to yourself. And we'll end, we'll end here in that section and end um, with Ibn Arabi's advice, he said, <clears throat> I have called your attention to a great adab, which will benefit you if you apply it to yourself. The great, the great adab here is knowing your limits. It's knowing your limits. Musa alayhi salam and Khidr alayhi salam, they both had their limits and they both knew them and they didn't go past them. Can you imagine the, the knowledge of Khidr and the knowledge of Musa gathered into one person? This complete person. This complete person. Can you imagine Khidr he had he would he would have had the knowledge of the date palms and everything and everything else. And Musa had the knowledge of Sharia. Can you imagine those two types of knowledge is placed into one person? And how did Musa, I mean, how did Khidr, how would he have knowledge of the date palms? He would have had knowledge of it, not even so much in the expertise or in the science of them. He would have known the benefit of planting at that moment and not planting at that moment. And he would also have known the benefit of planting at that moment in a way which would cause, which would give bad fruits. And how do we know the Prophet peace upon him didn't know that? Maybe he just didn't say anything. So if you have the Sharia and you have the Hakika wrapped up into one individual, imagine the adab that that person has. Imagine a person who has the sharia and has the haqiqah and he is those things wrapped up into one person. Imagine what kind of adab that person has even with his own self. He doesn't transgress even in his own self. It's, it's, perf it's perfection and that's why this person is called insan kamil. The insan kamil has the most perfect adab with Allah knowing at each moment exactly what Allah's will is at each moment he has tawfiq in each moment. There's never a moment when his will and Allah's will are not separ are, 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 are separated. Even, even when we deem it to be otherwise, even when we think it's otherwise,
So if there is an individual in each time, in each age, who has this kind of position with God, he knows the Sharia and he knows the Hakika perfectly, it behooves us to have the best of adab towards that individual because having the best of adab towards that individual is having the best of adab, adab towards Allah because Allah said, فَفِرُّوا إِلَى اللَّهِ إِنِّي لَكُمْ مِنْهُ نَذِيرٌ مُبِينٌ So flee to Allah, I am to you from Him an open warner. The way you get to Allah is through the open warner. And the open warner is the one who shows you openly the proper adab with God. Alhamdulillah. May Allah give us tawfiq. And I mean that in, in the sense of this lesson or this conversation or, or, or whatever it is. وصلى الله وسلم على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم سبحان ربك رب العزة ما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين الحمد لله